Well, good evening everyone. It's nice to have you back. I'm sorry about the rainy weather. I'm sure that has something to do with why some of the, some of the others have uh, not arrived yet. As John said, we're here tonight for the second night of our seminar. And if you go back to the list of topics last night, we spent our time basically introducing the topic. And tonight we're going to focus our attention on studying about it. So last night we talked about uh, basically just defining terms and trying to understand what homosexuality is. And tonight we're going to go into the second part, and then tomorrow we'll finish up the third part. So we're just looking at kind of a review of what we, what we found out. We started by looking at the Bible, and the point that we wanted to bring out about this is that when you look inside the Bible and study the contents, you see that it has a lot to say about itself. It claims that it is a message that comes from God, that it belongs to God, and that we need to be careful, therefore, how we study it, because it's His message, not ours. And this is very important, because in our world today, we have 38,000 different religious groups, and each one of those claim that they follow what the Bible says. But all of them have different teachings, different interpretations. And that's very easy to understand, because if you don't carefully try to put all your verses into context so that you get the original meaning that was intended by the person who was writing or speaking, then you can make, make the Bible say whatever you want it to say, and lots of people do that today. So we need to remember that it's important for us to remember that God is the owner of the message, and it's His authority that we have to make sure that we maintain. So we only have permission to teach and to, to follow and live in our lives the things that God says, not necessarily what we want. Now we started looking at some, some verses that showed some warnings. And one of the warnings that was predicted in the future was that in the future people would not hold on to the correct teachings, but that they would, they would go around looking for teachers that would say the things that they want to hear, and they would join up with those teachers. So, the point that we, we brought out and saw, especially in verses like Matthew 7, 21 to 23, is that it isn't enough for us to claim to be a Christian. The important thing is whether Christ claims us. And the only way that Christ is going to claim us is if we live a life that is based on the things that were given by His Father who is in the heavens. And that's what the Bible is, and that's why we have to be careful and make sure that everything that we do and everything that we believe is really what the Bible says. After that, then, after our snack time, we came back and we started looking at homosexuality, because that's the topic of our seminar. So what we learned about it basically is summarized in these points. First of all, homosexuality has to do with a person's sexual orientation. And what that means basically is uh, homosexual people are sexually attracted to people that have the same gender. So men are attracted to men, and women are attracted to women. Now, we looked at the history and saw that in the beginning, or in the early, early years, people used to think that homosexuality was a disease, a mental disease. But a lot of research that came about as a result of that, that incorrect assumption, actually proved that homosexuality is not a disease at all. It is simply a lifestyle. It is a lifestyle that people can choose to have. Okay? There is no biological reason to, to say that a person is born to be a homosexual. Just like you can't say a person is born to be a murderer or a, a thief or anything else. A lot of different factors go into the kind of decisions that we make that form the person that we are. Our personality, the things that we do, and the decisions that we make have consequences that also affect us. And so there's nothing different between homosexuality and anything else in our, in our lives and in our world around us. But the important thing is to realize that homosexuality is not a disease. It is a lifestyle, and it has to do with choices. Well, the bottom line in everything that we saw in our research yesterday basically just tells us that homosexuality is, according to the world, a normal pattern of behavior. Psychology, psychiatry, medical science, all of these point to the idea that because homosexuality is is a normal process, it's a normal biological pattern of behavior. Therefore, it's not something people should be concerned about. And we looked at other things too. We looked at the evolution of, of homosexuality, how it went from being a, classified as deviant behavior or immoral to where it is today, where it's now classified as normal behavior. And we saw that a lot of things happened. But the most important thing that we learned from that was that in the world, when you take God out of the picture, 
The world decides what is moral and what is acceptable by simply applying democratic social principles. Whatever the majority of people decide is, is legal or permissible, that becomes the laws. And that's a very important thing for us to, to, uh, to understand. Because we ended, uh, the last part of our material last time was, was looking at the question, who decides what is moral and what is not moral? And we said there were two answers to that question. The first answer has to do with society. The second answer has to do with something else, and that's what we're here to look at tonight. So society has its way of determining what's moral, and that's really based on democratic processes, votations, majority rules, these kinds of things. Looking at what normal social behavior that's acceptable, what, what these things are, they have a very big impact and influence on what the laws are within a given population of people. But one of the flaws is, is that if we only go by what the majority is doing, then what is considered to be moral can change as the future comes upon us in future times because if the social customs of a group of people change, it's possible that something that was prohibited by your grandparents will suddenly become acceptable to your grandchildren. And so it may be illegal in the time of your grandparents and legal in the time of your children. And you're sitting here in the middle scratching your head saying, what's going on? Where do I fit into this? Am I right or am I wrong? Because your grandma, your, your grandma would say, yes, you're wrong, and your, your grandchild would say, no, grandma, you're right. That's the problem with building a moral system based on social norms, because social norms change. We're going to go into that much deeper in our, our discussion tomorrow night, because we're going to expand it a little bit. But tonight what we're here to do is to, to examine that second, that second option, that second answer to the question of who decides what is moral. Because the first one was society, using social norms within the community, using democratic processes, votations, majority rules, these kinds of things. But there is a, a problem, as we said. Allowing social norms to determine morality has its difficulties. Different social communities might, come up with this, might not come up with the same definition or set of values. Uh, when I think about this, I think about culture. Different countries have different cultures. And a lot of those cultures differ in that they have, they have things which are permitted to do in their country, but if you go to another country, if you do those things in another country, then you'll be committing some kind of, of an error. I remember when I was in the Philippines first, uh, I was told that, now this is more of a social custom, a, a cultural custom that really isn't, isn't a, a, an illegal, immoral thing, but this is just an illustration. When, when I came to the Philippines the first time, uh, I didn't know what the Philippine culture was really about. And I was out one day with one of my Filipino teachers, and there was a young man over here who was standing a little bit far away, and I wanted him to come to me. So I, I called his attention, and I, I went to him and I went, come, come here like this. And my teacher said, no, 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 you don't do that. You go like this. You, you, you have your hand down like this. You don't ever do like this. You always have your hand down like this. Well, that's a cultural practice. See, where I come from in, in the United States, you just say, hey, come here. There's, there's no problem with that. But in this country, or in this culture, it's different. Well, this is just a, a very benign or, or simple example. But what if we're talking about things like homosexuality? What if homosexuality is, is OK in one country, but it's not in another? Well, who decides which country is right, which country is wrong? Well, each country's going to think they're right, and the other country's going to think they're right. People go to war over issues like this. So this is a very important question, then. Who ultimately decides whether something is moral or not? Because otherwise, all you have to do in the world is just find out what country has the moral standard that you want and become a citizen of that country. It's just the same thing as what we have in religion. People find a church that says and teaches what they want, and so they join that church. And they think, wow, this is great, I'm a Christian. What we saw, and this is kind of a lead into where we're going tonight, is that just because people think that their Christianity is right does not mean it's right. There is a standard that has been given to us that applies to all people who claim to be believers in God, and everyone is going to be measured by that standard, and that standard is the Bible. Well, I wonder if there isn't also a standard like that for morality. That's what we're going to see tonight. 
So anyway, there, the problem is communities in different places might not come up with the same definition of or sense of values. Values adopted by one generation might change in future generations. The bottom line is there's just no consistency. And that's the problem with this worldly way of determining what is moral and what is not. Anytime you're going to base something on social norms, it's, when social norms change, the definition of morality changes. So this brings us now to the second answer. The second answer to the question of who decides? It's God. And he decides this through the teachings that he's given to us in the Bible. Now what we're going to do is, is explore this as we go forward tonight. Now we've already looked at in our first section 1A of this seminar, we looked at a lot of passages that showed what the Bible is. It is given by God, it is useful, it is for training, for teaching, for correcting errors. It is complete. There are warnings that we should not alter it or change it, take away from it in any way, and that what we need to do is be very careful how we handle the message because God gave it to us for the purpose of establishing this standard of behavior, this standard of morality. And it's there, it was given, and it is here for all times. So this is one of the major differences between the way the world determines morality and the way God does. Because if we trust in God to establish morality, His laws are the same for all people living in all places who will live in all times. His laws do not change. Another thing, there is no culture in God's laws. There is no Filipino, there is no Chinese, there is no Korean, there is no American, there is no Russian. Because the laws are not for any one particular culture of people. Those laws inside the Bible are non or acultural, as they say. They are not part of any culture. In fact, they establish a culture all their own. A culture that is based on what God says. Another thing, there is no generation gap. There is not one culture for the young and another culture for the old. That's one of the big problems in society today. Young people and old people have a difficult time communicating and getting along because the old people think the young people have no respect because the young people won't listen when the old people give advice. And the young people don't like the old people because they're old. And their life is boring, Kono. And they don't have the knowledge that we have, Kono. And so there's this big gap. Well, if we if we listen to what the world says and try to live by the world, we're going to continue to have that. But if we go back to God, it doesn't work like that. Because there's the same standard for young people as there is for old people. And that means old people really do have something to contribute to advise the young. Because the one thing that the old people have that the young people don't is life experience living under these rules. And they can share with the young people the difficulties that there is in living under these rules and to help the young people to avoid some of the mistakes that they made. Why? Because the rules will never change. It's the same set of rules. Because there is consistency. Another thing that's important, if we look at God as defining the, the rules, aside from, from all these other things, He defines the relationships between people. He gives us the definitions of what being a man is all about, being a woman, being a husband, being a wife, being a father, and even children. All of these roles are defined by Him, and He gives His expectations for what each of these different parts of the family structure are supposed to accomplish. And that's very important, because one of the big problems we have in the world today is that our, our family structure is breaking down. The family, as a, as, as, a, as a concept, is not the same as it used to be. And one of the reasons is because of the worldly way of establishing things, because the family, just like morals, is determined by the social norms. So, the role of the father is determined by the collective sum of what fathers are doing in the world today, and that determines what's acceptable. Well, that means, in the same way as we looked at morality, the whole idea of family is going to evolve and change as time goes by. And that's not good. As we see, everybody agrees that the family is in a very, very great danger. Well, if we go back to God, God defined the family when He created it back at the very beginning, and nothing's changed. So if everybody in the world would submit to these roles and these definitions, there wouldn't be any problem. Why? Because with God, there's consistency. He doesn't change. His expectations do not change. So with that in mind, what does God actually say about our topic? We're here to study homosexuality. Now, one of the things that you have to do when you learn to study the Bible is you have to be able to learn how to find information 
that's inside the Bible that has to do with questions that you have in your mind. Because we all have questions, and we know the answers are there in the Bible, but how do we go and find the places where we need to look to find information that has something to say about our question? Well, come and study with us at the Bible Study Center, and we'll help you to learn all of that. We have courses that are designed to help you to learn how to study the Bible. Because if you don't know how to use the Bible, it's impossible for you to go in there and find the answers. And one of the big reasons why so many people like yourselves are, are victimized by fast-talking, very eloquent-speaking pastors and pastors and priests and different religious leaders is because you don't trust yourself to go and look up these things for yourself because simply you don't know how to use the book. Okay? Now, I provided the information for you in this outline that gives you all the information that we're going to be looking at tonight. And this is the information that speaks directly to the subject. And I've researched and found it, found it in both parts of the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to, first of all, before we have our break for the snacks, look at what the Old Testament has to say about homosexuality. And one of the problems we have with many of our questions is that the Bible is not arranged according to topic. In other words, you can't just go to the back of the Bible and look for an index and look for the word homosexuality, and then it will give you all the places where the word homosexuality is used. Mainly because the word homosexuality is not a word that the translators use to translate the words that speak about homosexuality. And so that's another problem that we have. So anyway, the evidence that I give you here tonight, th this is it. Now, just some introductory thoughts before we, we go into the subject of homosexuality. Because in order to understand what God says about homosexuality, you need to first of all understand some things about how God created us. And if you go back to, and we don't, we don't really need to look at Bible verses, because I think everybody, regardless of your religious background, if you are a, a Bible-believing person, then you've heard these stories before. We know that man got started because God created him. And in the creation, God created mankind as male and female. Remember the story? Remember how it happened? He created the man first, and then the man was alone. He saw that man needed a helper, so God created the animals, brought them to the man to see what he would name them, and yet there was no helper that was suitable for him. And so God caused the man to go to sleep. He took out some part of his body and fashioned a woman, breathed life into her, and brought her to the man. And man said, wow, now this is more like it. And that's how man and woman got started. And right there at that spot is where we see the foundation of men and women becoming husband and wife being established by God. That's where the family was created. And all this is in Genesis. Genesis chapter 2, chapter 3 in that area. Okay? Now, so God created man and made them male and female. He created them with the ability to reproduce. Everything that God created was created with the ability to reproduce. And so, one of the things we need to remember is that reproduction can only be done between males and females. You can't have reproduction man with man or woman with woman because reproduction can only happen between males and females. See, and that's what sexual relations are primarily for, for reproduction. That's the way it is in everything that God created. Sexual reproduction is for the purpose of producing offspring. And that's the natural way that God set things in motion. And so this is, this is the actual reason why, as we're going to see later, that sexual relations between males and females is considered natural. The natural sexual relation is a relationship between a male and a female. Because that's the way God designed us. That's the way we were created. And the main purpose of that was for reproduction. And just remember, no matter how hard it is tried, males on males cannot reproduce, and females on females cannot reproduce. Okay? Very, very important. Now, with that in mind, let's look at passages. There aren't many passages in the Bible that talk about homosexuality. Probably the most, the most well-known passage in the Old Testament that has something to say about homosexuality is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. So we're going to start there because that's the first one we, we come in contact with if we start in the book of Genesis and go to the book of Malachi. So the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is contained in Genesis chapter 19. And if you read through that story, you will find that basically 
The story centers around a young man, or a man named Lot. He wasn't necessarily a young man. Now, this man Lot was a relative of a man named Abraham. And Abraham has been the main character of the story, starting from about chapter 15 up to, uh, up to 25 when he dies. And there are many things about Abraham. But this story of Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah kind of is a sideline story inside the story of Abraham. Now, if you look at the, the background, Lot and Abraham were very close. And there, there was a time in their lives when they had to make a decision about where they were going to live. And so Abraham basically told Lot, well, you pick where you want to go. You go this way and I'll go that way, or you go that way, I'll go this way. And so he gave the decision to Lot. So Lot looked and he saw this looks really good, so he said, I'm going to go this way. And he ended up going in this place that is now Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham went to a different place. So now, the story is much later. Lot is now living in Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham receives some visitors. And these visitors, turns out, is the Lord and a couple of his assistants. And the Lord tells Abraham that he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham, he's very upset, or he's very concerned, because his nephew, Lot, lives there. And so he makes this appeal to the Lord to please not, not destroy the city. And so it's a very interesting story in chapter 18 about a... A, uh, a hangio that, that Abraham has with the Lord. Very, very interesting part of the story. But in the final analysis, God sends the two, the two assistants to go to Sodom and Gomorrah. And so when they get to Sodom and Gomorrah, they stay at the house of Lot. So if you read through the story, the, the important part happens in the evening. When these two visitors are at Lot's house, he's entertaining them. What happens is it says that men from the city came and gathered outside of Lot's house. And they began to knock on the door. Did you read the story? What, what were they wanting? Amen. They were wanting Lot's visitors. Yeah. They wanted them to come outside. And your translation probably says something like, bring them out so that we can know them. And you're thinking, oh, that's very neighborly. They want to <laughs> meet these guys so that they can welcome them to the city. If you're thinking that, you're really, really, really down the wrong path. The word no here is the key to the whole thing. This is the key to the whole story. Now, if we look at the word no that you find in that, that place where it says, bring them out so that we can know them, the word in the original Hebrew language is a word that means have sexual intercourse with. Oh, wow, now that really changes it. Bring them out so that we can know them? This was not a good place. And what was, another thing that's interesting is, is to look at Lot's response. But actually, before we do that, there's one more point before we go. Now, aside from the Hebrew Old Testament, there was a translation of the Hebrew Bible into Greek that was translated before Jesus ever came to the earth. It was a translation that was called the Septuagint. And writers in the New Testament made quotations in their writings. Whenever you see a quotation from an Old Testament passage, it's taken from the Septuagint. And if we go back to this story of Lot and we look at the word that's there, we see that just like in the Hebrew language, the word for no in this, in this place is a word that means sexual intercourse. This is the Greek word, sun genomai, which actually means sexual intercourse as well in the Greek language. And so that confirms that we're not misunderstanding the situation. These guys were asking Lot to send his visitors out so that they could have sexual relations with them. That means these guys were homosexuals. Because that's what happens. These men were wanting to have sex with these men that were inside. There's no other way you can, you can look at this. Because they were, the word that is describing what they wanted was they wanted sexual relations with these guys. Okay, so these men outside wanted to have homosexual sex with Lot's <coughs> guests. That cannot be denied. There is no way that you can, you can alter that or change the, the facts and details of what was happening outside of Lot's house. Okay, very important. So now, what was Lot's reaction? Here's another thing that we need to consider. If they were wanting to know these men, like introduce to them and welcome them to the city, you wouldn't expect Lot to say, oh, fine, let's go outside and meet these guys. What was Lot's reaction as recorded in the passages? Was he happy? No, he said, do not do this evil deed. See, he went outside, closed the door behind him, and tried to reason with these men. Do not do this evil thing. So Lot's understanding also confirms that what they were trying to do was not a good thing. It was evil. Now, what were they wanting to do? They were wanting to have homosexual sex with Lot's visitors. So in Lot's mind, it was evil. 
And he didn't want it to happen. Very important evidence in our journey, looking at what the Bible has to say about this. So Lot's understanding of what the men wanted was very simple. They wanted homosexual se sex, and what they were asking to do was evil. Now, one point that, that may be important to you, because perhaps you've heard of a term in English called sodomy. If you've ever heard of the term sodomy, that was a very, very old legal term that was used in the law books to refer to homosexuality. They didn't use the word homosexual, they used the idea of sodomy. Well, this word sodomy, guess, guess where it came from? It came from this story. It came from this story because these people were wanting to have homosexual sex with lots of visitors. That is very, very obvious. And so that's where the term sodomy came from. Or to sodomize someone would be a man having homosexual sex with another man. It would be just like raping a woman, but it would be raping a man, force, forcing himself on someone in a homosexual sort of way. That's where this word and, and its this affiliated terms came from. So this is the situation then with Sodom and Gomorrah. So please don't misunderstand that. If, if someone has ever tried to tell you, oh, no, no, it has nothing to do with homosexuality, these guys just wanted to be friends with these men. That's why they said, bring them out so you can introduce them to us. No, that's not what it means. Yeah, and these, you know, sometimes when we study the Bible, the only way that we can, can unravel difficulties and be able to, to understand what's really going on is to go and isolate and look at the words that we find in the original language Go to the dictionaries and see what these words actually mean. And that's not difficult to do. You guys, you guys that have English as a second language, I'm sure that you've heard English words before that you did not understand. And yet, you could go to a dictionary and learn what those words mean. I do that all the time with Cebuano. So this is no different because we just have to remember that the Old Testament was written in a language that's not English, Cebuano, Korean, Japanese. It's written in the Hebrew language. And it was translated in other languages. That, that Septuagint translation is very important to us because one of the problems with the Hebrew language is that it's not very specific. It's not very precise. But the Greek language is very precise. So being able to compare the Hebrew Bible and the Greek Bible and what they say with this message that was, was already finished and put down before Jesus ever came to the earth is a very, very important resource for us. Okay, so let's leave behind the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And let's go to the book of Leviticus. Now when we get into the book of Leviticus, we are into what are called the, the laws and, and ordinances that God gave to the people of Israel. If you study the Old Testament, and I'll mention a little bit of this later on, you discover that the Old Testament is actually a contract. It's one of two contracts that are inside of our Bibles. The Old Testament is the old contract, and the New Testament is the new contract. And if you look at this, and understand this, you will see that that's the reason why the two parts of our Bible are there. And that's why there are differences between the Old and the New. It's not that God has different laws, it's that the Old Testament was a, a contract that God put together and offered to the people of Israel. Started at Mount Sinai, He explains the terms and the details, gives them the option to accept it or reject it. They accepted it, and, and the rest of the Old Testament, after we get from Exodus to Malachi, is a record of God and His dealings with His chosen people. Now, if you go to the end of the story, the people of Israel lost their status as God's chosen people. And He, he took away the contract because they violated it so many times. And because of that, He announced that in the future, He's going to make a new agreement. People of Israel will be included, but He's going to make it not just with Israel, but with everybody. And guess what? That's the new agreement. And that's why the New Testament marks a new contract where God takes His laws and He puts them down into a contract with a condition. Either you, know, you can accept it or reject it. And as long as you do it, then you'll be my people, I'll be your God. But the difference is, the first agreement was for Israel only. And the second one is for anyone from any nation who wants to, from any time. So that's, that's something else you need to understand. And if you want to see all of this, again, we're in classes because we take you through all of this and let you look at all this evidence for yourself so that you can come to understand it. Now, if we go into the book of Leviticus, it's one of the places where we have the specific lists of laws that all the people had to perform. And if you look at it all, 
There's more than 600 different individual laws and regulations that the people of Israel had to do in this agreement. And all of it under this condition. As long as you do it, I will be your God and you will be my people. Wow, it's very, very difficult. Now in Leviticus chapter 18, here is what the law had to say. If you look at Leviticus 18.22, here is a specific law about homosexuality. And it's very important because this is God giving His law to the people. So if you turn to it and, want, and read it, what does it say? Well, this passage says that if a man sleeps with another man, that's wrong. He, in fact, he says it's detestable. Now, very important. This is speaking about sexual relations and strictly prohibits men from having sex with other men. Literally, if you look at what the verse says, literally, it speaks about a man laying in bed with a woman the way, a, I mean, with a man the way a man lies in the, with a woman in the marriage bed. Now, you think about this, the marriage bed. What is the marriage bed? It's, it's kind of confusing. But you need to remember something else. Unlike our time, where in our time people have sex with each other for whatever reason, during this time, people didn't do that. <clears throat> the only time people had sex legally, and especially religious people who had made their promise of loyalty to God, was at the marriage bed. That was where sex relations started between two people, legally, as far as God was concerned. Now, that means a man and a woman getting married and having sexual relations. That's what this is talking about. So what's his point? Men can't do that with other men. God doesn't like it. How does God feel about it? He thinks it's detestable. That's the word that's there. Your Bible said, may say, it's an abomination or other words like that. But that's what the word actually means there. It's detestable. Now, is something detestable good or bad? If my wife cooks me a meal and I eat that, and I respond and I say, sweetie, this is detestable. <coughs> is that a wise thing for me to say? No, it's not. No, it's not, not if I want to uh, sleep in the house tonight, <laughs> or maybe for the next year. Detestable is a bad thing. Okay? So this is God's, this is the first specific reference that we have of God stating exactly what He feels about homosexuality. Now, there's another passage. Two chapters over. Leviticus 20, verse 13. He comes back to it. And what he says this time is the same thing. He uses the same wording as before, but there's a difference this time. Because not only does it specifically prohibit men from having sex with other men, this one gives a punishment. God says, if you find this happening, it's death to both people. Now this is very important. See, a lot of people today, they look at this and they say, well, this, see, see what kind of God this is? They will say two things. They'll say, well, this is, this is not a good God. We don't want this God. So He must not exist because this is just not fair. And another side, they will say, well, see, this just shows that the Bible is not real. That the Bible is a, it's a bunch of lies. It's a bunch of things that people put together. Because nobody is, is going to be gullible enough to believe that God is going to say, you should kill these people. No, that's not the way we have to look at this. We have to look at this for what it is. This was a contract between God and the people of Israel. One of the things you'll see if you study the Old Testament is that one of the reasons why God chose the people of Israel is because all the other nations were like nations today. They did not listen to Him. They made their own rules. They had their own gods. And even though He was nice to them and gave them rain and sunshine and moon and crops and all this other stuff, instead of turning to Him and asking, them for, asking Him for guidance, they did their own thing. And they were doing very bad things. So when God took the people of Israel out of Egypt and brought them to this promised land, this promised land was, was occupied by a bunch of different nations. And He told them He was going to drive those nations out and give the land to them, to the Israelites. And when you go into the book of, of Deuteronomy and, and Leviticus, and you look at what God says when He explains to the people through Moses why He's giving this land, He tells them several things. He tells them, don't you think for a minute that you deserve this land. And don't you think for a minute that, that I'm giving this to you because you're the greatest nation in the world. And every time he comes back to this point, I'm giving you this land, not because you're so good, but because I'm angry at these people. Because they didn't do what, I'm, what I wanted them to do. So I'm driving them out and I'm going to give you their land. See, so you have to realize, this is God we're dealing with. 
And if you believe in God, then you have to believe this story. You can't say, well, I believe in God, but I'm not going to accept His Word. Because if you're going to say, I believe in God, and you're not going to accept His Word, then how are you going to have a consistent understanding of what He wants you to do? Because then you're at the mercy of the 38,000 groups. And remember what we said last night. That group is 38,000 now, but it used to be 20. And then it used to be 1,000. And at one time it used to be 1 back when it started, when Jesus was on the earth. So, if you're going to say, I believe in God, but you're not going to believe this story, then you're in a very difficult situation for yourself. So, what do we see here? Well, if we keep going in this, we see why. Why did God give the punishment of death for these people? Because, whoa, two clicks. Because he says it's detestable. He uses the same word again. He says you'll kill these people because it's detestable. Now, I ask you in all honesty, we've seen these passages. We have Sodom and Gomorrah. We have a statement in Leviticus in two chapters. And we have now him saying, you kill these guys. What is God's feeling about homosexuality? Does he approve it or not? It's up to you. But now, before we get too involved in homosexuality, you need to realize that God had a very, very, very specific idea in His mind about the broader term of sexual immorality and sexual morality. And He speaks about these things in many places. For example, if you look at other passages in the law that talk about sexual issues, you will find that he, he, he prescribed death penalty for anyone that, have, that would have sexual relations with an animal. That's a practice that people do today, too. You know, okay. Well, what about adultery? Death. Both parties. Both parties. You know, it was a death penalty. That was what it was in the Old Testament. No sexual relations with close, close relatives. And there, there are several passages that specifically define relationships that sexual relations were forbidden. God was very specific. Sex between unmarried people, automatic marriage. When I was a young man, there used to be something called shotgun wedding. It was pretty close to this. It wasn't just when you had sex with someone when you're not married, but if you got a woman pregnant, it was automatic marriage. Well, in the Bible times, in the Old Testament, in the, in the land of Israel, under this agreement, if a man who was unmarried had sexual relations, and the context of this is forcing himself, upon one. If he forces himself and has sex with a woman and she's not married, he has to go to her father, make the arrangements, and he gets married with her. That was the only option in that situation. Now, there's another situation here. Say that a woman was engaged to a man and a man comes and rapes her. This is very interesting. If a woman is engaged and a man rapes her and she calls out and, and tries to yell for help while he's raping her, then the rapist gets killed. But if a woman who's engaged to a man is being raped by a man and she keeps silent and doesn't cry out, then both of them are to be killed because she didn't try to resist. Interesting, no? Now, you might look at this and you say, wow. But the point in this is that when you look at God's ideas, He cares very much about us. He cares enough to look at specific details and specific circumstances. He's not just telling us, well, you guys go out there and be nice in your sexual relations. He gives us a very graphic and very detailed view of what He expects from us regarding our contact, contact and, and conduct with the opposite sex regarding sexual things. Now this is God speaking. Now compare that to what we see in the world. The world doesn't do that. The world doesn't really care. As long as you want to do it, you're in the privacy of your home, whatever. And many times today, the, the moral values of society just, it, it's, it's applied in an unjust way. Uh, you know, people take advantage of other people all the time. And the rich people get the justice that they want and the poor people don't. With God, you cannot escape. No one can escape His justice in this situation. So when we look at the Old Testament, it's a very, 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 very serious situation. Because God is very concerned about the sexual matters, not just about homosexuality. Now, as I was saying earlier, I've got some of the details here now. When you look at the other nations, the laws that God gave at Sinai were for Israel only. The other nations did not have 
the Ten Commandments and the sacrificing laws and all these laws about human relationships because it was only for the nation of Israel. In fact, there's evidence there. There's a passage in the Old Testament where one of the prophets later on is talking to the people, saying that God gave these, these statutes and ordinances to all Israel, and He's not done so with any other nation. They don't know Him. Why? Because God favored Israel because of who they were. They were children of Abraham, and Abraham was God's friend, and he had made a promise way back there in the early times that he was going to make his, his children into a great nation. God fulfilled that promise by choosing Israel and making them his chosen people. But it wasn't just because he loved Abraham. But there was also this other thing that he, he, he did not choose the other nations because they did not believe in him and they did not know who he was. So these other nations, how did they determine their laws? Well, they used society to determine their morality. They were just like the nations of today. They, they did social norms. Whatever was the social norm of their, their culture, that's what formed their laws. Just like what happens today. And if you look at history, you'll see that's the way it went. And if you look at those nations, you'll see the same evolution that took place during their ancient times that we see today as far as moral behavior, laws of the land, changes in, in behavior patterns and, and culture and all these other things. Why? Because they did the same thing that people in the world do today. They used the same processes. Everything was basically the same. And their, their societies suffered the same problems that we have in our own world. God, in fact, if you look carefully, you'll see that God did not want the Israelites to have any contact with these people. He didn't want them to marry people from, their, from these different countries. He wanted them to, to stay away from them. Why? If you look at that, it's because He didn't want the people to have their minds polluted or changed into and influenced into thinking the way the people in the world did. Because he was very upset because those people refused to accept that God was real and let him be the one to, to guide them and to give them their, their laws, even though he's the one who created them, even though he's the one that gave them all the things that they had that made them great. So a very interesting situation we find. So again, to see the details of all of these statements that I've been making, about the Old Testament times and Israel and all of this, you need to uh, come and study. And when you get to the course, Jesus, Lord of our lives, you're going to study all about these things in great detail, especially about the agreements and the conduct of the other nations. So that's what the Old Testament has to say. So let's summarize what we've seen, and then we'll take a break for some snacks. So God had very strict rules about sexual morality in general inside the Old Testament. He was very specific about things that he accepted and things that he did not. <clears throat> and he spoke very, very specifically about homosexuality. He said it was detestable <clears throat> and punishable by death. So according to the evidence in the Old Testament, homosexuality was forbidden. And that's what the book says. However, to be fair, we also need to look in the New Testament and see what it says. Now, why do we need to do that? Well, very simply. I mentioned to you in passing that the Bible has two parts, Old Testament, New Testament, and that these two parts are actually two contracts. Now, contra contracts are important, and we have to look at what the contract says, and there are certain questions that we ask. Who made this contract? Who are the ones that the contract is made with? What are the details of the contract, and what are the terms and the conditions? And once we find that, then we follow the history and see, okay, did these people live up to the contract? Did the contract fulfill itself? Is it still in force? Is it not? And what we see is the old contract is gone. It is set aside and a new one has taken its place. But what we have to do is we have to look at the new contract and ask the same questions. Who made it? Who is it with? What are the details? What are the terms and conditions? And when you compare the two contracts together, you're going to find that there are some things in the first one that aren't in the second one. For example, one of the things that's very important in the first agreement Sacrificing animals on behalf of the sins of the people in a big place called the temple. That isn't in the New Testament. In the New Testament, there's only one sacrifice, and that's the sacrifice of Christ on that cross, giving His blood to take away the sins of all people. In the Old Testament, every sin you had had to have a corresponding animal sacrifice. In the New Testament, there's only one sacrifice. That means they're different. So maybe what we'll find then is that even though God speaks very specifically and very, very much against the idea of homosexuality in the Old, maybe since the New Testament focuses on grace and tolerance, that maybe God has changed His view. 
So in all fairness, we have to wait before we make a final conclusion and look and see what the New Testament says. Okay? So that's what we're going to do after the break.